This is hell. It's time to give up on hope and to start grieving for our planet, which is already suffering from climate change and will begin suffering far worse climatic events far sooner than expert climatologists are predicting. That is, if recent history is any sign of what is yet to come. Here to tell us how to give up hope and avoid hopelessness, to find the power of grief and address what, what might be the worst aspects of climate change, journalist Dar Jamal returns to This Is Hell. He is the author of a new book, The End of Ice, Bearing Witness and Finding Meaning in the Path of Climate Change. How you doing, Dar? Hey, Chuck. I'm all right. How are you doing? Good. It's really great to have you on the show, especially because, you know, you originally came on the show to talk about the, re- do this really, really, I mean, just fun time, happy-go-lucky reporting from the front lines of the war in Iraq right at the beginning, to now this really happy, exciting story of climate change. So I just want to thank you for staying right in the this is hell strike zone where we can really hit a home run with you each and every time, sir. Well, thanks a lot, Jack. I appreciate that. Doesn't that make you happy? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm just over the moon about reporting on all this death and tragedy. See, thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. You really help our ratings. Uh, you write that <laughs> the reporting in this book has turned out to be far more difficult to deal with than the years I spent reporting from war-torn Iraq. And we interviewed you, as I was saying, several times reporting from the Iraq war, including one time uh, you were talking to us from the rooftop of a home in Baghdad, which wasn't the most clever thing, because I understand that they're shooting people on rooftops. And listeners can find those conversations at our Patreon page. Why was reporting, or why is reporting on climate change more difficult than reporting on war, where you see the devastation and death everywhere around you every day? Because, I mean, you were an unembedded uh, journalist, so it's not like you were getting a pretty view of the war. Why is reporting on climate change worse? And did reporting from the Iraq war actually prepare you for the worst? I, well, I think it, it was more challenging overall and, and has been and continues to be because going into a war zone, you know, I mean, I expected the worst. I mean, I expected uh, bodies and, and tragedies and, you know, just the death of people who were civilians and, and had nothing to do with what was actually happening and everything else that goes along with war. But with the climate, I mean, obviously I expected, I mean, I had done my research. I knew going out into the field I was going to see vanishing glaciers, bleaching coral reefs, uh, you know, loss of habitat for species, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I did, but it, it really hit me on, on a, a visceral, visceral level doing this reporting that, you know, this is the biosphere. This is, you know, Iraq was not to, not to, uh, really downplay the, the scope of that tragedy. Over a million Iraqis got, have died as a result of that invasion and occupation. But we're talking about the entire planet. We're talking about not just the human species, but other species that are caught in the crossfire, so to speak, of, of climate change. And and when we really allow this to, to, to sink in, like what that really means, and literally the existential threat now that climate change poses to, I would say, literally every species on the planet, including our own, then that makes it a whole lot harder pill to swallow. I never cite dedications to books. I never quote them during interviews with authors. But your dedication has everything to do with the content of your book. You write, this book is dedicated to the future generations of all species know that there were many of us who did what we could. Now, all I can do in my position as a radio show host is to have people on like you to inform the public of climate change, its causes and effects. Last week, we started the show by talking with N Plus One magazine editor Marco Roth, who was lead author on an article about climate change called The Best of a Bad uh, Situation. But Marco says we all know climate change is happening, even Republicans and those on the right, including President Trump, who were in denial. It's just that their plan to address climate change is building walls and making mass migration uh, due to climate change as difficult as possible. Was doing what we could to fight climate change, was informing the public of climate change enough? And if it wasn't, why wasn't it enough? 
Well, obviously, nothing that myself or any of the rest of us trying to uh, alert people to the crisis and educate people and do what all of us can do in our individual lives to try to change this crisis. Obviously, the collective effort has failed and continues to fail. Uh, so it hasn't been enough. Uh, if, it, if it was enough, uh, back when James Hansen, former uh, NASA lead scientist uh, in the 80s, when he alerted Congress, that's when he blew the whistle and said, look, this is a crisis. If we do not change what we're doing now, we are at grave risk of damaging the planet beyond repair. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but that was essentially his message, that message to Congress back in the 1980s. Uh, that was not heeded, and instead, uh, basically, global capitalist economic systems have stomped on the accelerator, and here we are, in, in smack in the middle of runaway climate change. And so, but that said, all of that said, uh, we're not finished yet. Like, there's, there is still valiant work and important work for all of us to do, because as grim as things are, and as, as grim as it, I show it to be at times in the book, there are, there are, there is life. There are still glaciers. There are still species. We are, you know, there are some species being saved and there is always work to do. And, and I think the moral obligation is on all of us now that no matter how bleak it might look, that we have to keep doing the right thing for the planet's sake, uh, if nothing else for that, because I think it comes down to now that, that we have to keep our eye on that ball. And part of it, is, for my own self, it's a psychological survival strategy, because if we just sit here and stare at the big picture, I mean, it's akin to, you know, overreading the news on any given day in the United States. You know, you're going to need to be on some antidepressants pretty quick. So uh, I think that we already are. Uh, so uh, <laughs> the you're talking about the work we need to do. Uh, last week, we were talking with Claire Farrell of Extinction Rebellion UK, and I believe the Extinction Rebellion rallies are happening today in Washington, D.C. and New York City, at least in those two cities. Uh, if information and marches didn't work to slow or stop climate change or at least address it, how much hope do you have for meaningful anti-climate change policy emerging from no longer framing climate change within a climate change denying or not context into one of its certain unquestionable outcomes and discontinuing marches in place of disruptions. Can reporting that climate change is already here and is already having devastating effects with confrontation lead to the kinds of policies that arguing climate change exists or not and taking to the streets in marches could not? Can confrontation work where marches, protests, and information didn't? I think it can in this instance, and, and I am very familiar with Claire. I, I've interviewed her, and I've done a story on Extinction Rebellion, because I don't normally write at all about protests and uprisings and things like this. But this, to me, is an exceptional time, because the message of Extinction Rebellion is so utterly clear and honest that if we do not rise up, around the world and force governments to have more sane policies, and not just have more sane policies, but we're talking about the revolutionary changes that have to happen if we're literally going to have a chance to survive. Because if you look at all of the science, and I, I detail this the best I can in my book, it's you know heavily, heavily footnoted to make it unarguable. It, we are in a dire, dire situation. I mean, right now, if we stopped all CO2 emissions across the board on a dime, we are looking at best-case scenario. We still have probably 3 degrees C warming baked into the system. And at 3 degrees C warming, we're looking at sea levels that are tens of feet higher than they are right now. We're looking at the loss of massive amounts of Antarctic and, and Greenland ice sheets. Uh, all the alpine glaciers in the world. I mean, we are looking at essentially big parts of the world already turning into something like Mad Max. Uh, yet, uh, that that is clear. And I think, as you said, more and more people are getting it. Even the Republicans whose message of denial persists, they know what's happening, and they're having to do that for their fossil fuel 
uh, uh, lobbyists and, and, and uh, the people pulling their strings. But the general population of the planet gets it. And I think more and more now, especially in just the last six months from scientific studies coming out to extreme weather events smacking people in the face across the globe, et cetera, et cetera, we are at a point now where I think the time is, is ripe for people to really, really get the message that we have to rise up and force the issue because clearly governments have failed. Clearly governments are not taking it upon themselves to do the right thing. And the only way that that's going to happen is if we force them to do so by making uh, business as usual and everyday life untenable for this current system. You write about mountain climbing on Earth Day 2003 with your climbing partner, Sean, in Alaska's Matanuska Glacier uh, toward Mount Marcus Baker in the Chugach Range and uh, falling into a glacial crevice, a fall that could have easily led to your death. You describe, despite the danger of my situation, the glacier's beauty calms me. So let me stretch that a little bit. Are we at that moment? Are we dangling in a crevice to our deaths, waiting for help, yet still mesmerized by nature's beauty, even to the point of being distracted? from doing anything about climate change and the potential death that awaits because of nature's beauty? I think that is an important point. I mean, I I think that that's relevant because the fact that I can look out my window right now when I'm talking to you and see, uh, you know, a forest within which I live that is in really good shape and the trees are thriving and uh, there's birds and, you know, I, I, there's, there's clean air where I live and I can turn on my tap and I can drink the water out of it. So I think that the fact that there is still functional biologic systems in the biosphere, I think is, is potentially why a lot of people maybe don't see the crisis. And I, I think that is the biggest challenge about talking about climate change is that the worst impacts are still in the future. And because it's not something smacking us in the face right at this moment, unless, let me, let me, you know, in parentheses, unless you live in the panhandle of Florida and just had your entire community wiped out by a hurricane, unless you live on the coastline of Bangladesh, unless you live on the coastline of southern uh, Mississippi or southern Louisiana, unless you live in Paradise, California, and your entire town just burnt to the ground and dozens of people that you know were incinerated alive. So, at, you know, overlooking that, those of us who haven't lived through direct overt horrors like that, uh, we can still look out and think, well, you know, it's not here yet. There's still time. There's still this. There's still that. And the reality is, is, is there's not because this situation is already affecting all of us. It's just, uh, you know, we've, we've become, become kind of inured or sort of allowed our imaginations to go to sleep where, if we hear about those people in those places that I just mentioned, you know, what, why is it so hard for us to not imagine that, well, that's happening? I understand that in the region where I live, ocean acidification, drought, wildfires are probably the current single biggest threats that are already starting to happen. But my house hasn't burned down yet, you know, so like what, why, why can't I just use my imagination for five seconds and, 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 you know, have empathy with these people in Paradise, California, who lost everything and understand, wow, that may well be happening to me soon. I better get off my ass and do something. You were talking about how, and I was mentioning that earlier, too, that even conservatives, even Republicans are, whether they realize it or not, their actions seem to be admitting to the fact that they understand that climate change is if not coming already here, and it's going to have a devastating impact on us. And I started thinking about how, because you're writing and you talk about climbing on glaciers, how the closer you are to, say, the Arctic, to the North Pole, the more you may notice climate change happening because it's having a more extreme effect at the uh, top of the globe. Yet Alaska, as we know, is a very, you know, and I could be getting it wrong, you lived there for 10 years at least, uh, Alaska is a very Republican state. So are even places that are traditionally conservative, are they seeing a change in their attitudes towards climate change? And do you think people who do live closer to the Arctic have a better understanding of climate change taking place? You know, this is, I'll do my best to talk about this coherently because 
what I saw in both, you know, first of all, Alaska and saying this from having lived up there for 10 years, uh, it's like politically it's a cold Texas. I mean, it's, you know, resource extraction, military, oil and gas. And so it's, it's a wild place to go and talk about and investigate and research climate change like I did for my book. I spent many, many months up there from being up in the town Utskiagvik, which is formerly known as Barrow. It was recently renamed to a native name, uh, to Denali, to out the Aleutian Islands, to the Pribilofs in the, in the Bering Sea, and talking to different people. And specifically, I'll use an example up in Utskiagvik. You know, the, it, this is the northernmost village in the United States, in, in, in Alaska for that matter. I'm, I'm sorry, in the United States and Alaska for that matter. And talking to people that were overtly conservative, uh, clearly Trump supporters, and they would say, like, we know that the climate is changing. I mean, we're watching the permafrost thaw. We're watching our buildings go into a state where we either have to invest millions of dollars to try to beef up this infrastructure and find a way to keep them here, here or move them. We're, we're, we literally are maintaining this dirt berm between our village and the Arctic Ocean because thawing permafrost and coastal erosion because of climate change are literally threatening the very existence of the entire village. They're aware of the fact that at present, at least 37 different villages around Alaska have to be relocated entirely because of these things. But yet, they would still parrot whatever the Trump meme of the day is or the fossil fuel meme, which is, okay, it's happening, but we don't know how much humans are responsible for it. So that would be the line. So, you know, what is, I think the one difference between, say, a conservative in a place there that is on the front line to people who are conservative who aren't directly on the front line is that those people on the front line, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. They have to admit it because they understand that they might have to abandon their entire village. Are we seeing, and I know that we are, but I want to make sure that people understand how we are already experiencing climate change and climate change affected by things that might be out of sight and out of mind. Are we experiencing any negative effects, any impact from uh, the glaciers, the kind of glaciers that you climbed on from glacier melting? Are we already experiencing some effects from glacier melting? With we, I would uh, use the collective we being uh, people all around the world and other species. So it, when one thing I learned, and I detail this in the book, talking with Dan Fagley, he's a, a, a U, U.S. geological survey scientist, a Glacier National Park, and he educated me about what happens when you lose the ice. So not just losing the water, right? When, you know, we rely on glaciers, they play a, a key role in that when we lose snowpack uh, that builds up during the winter and then that melts and that is drinking water and irrigation water for farming for people around the world. And then when that snowpack goes away, the glacier, that melt water replaces it for the X number of weeks or months between when the snowpack is gone until the new snow starts flying in late fall. The glaciers play that key role. And when those are gone, uh, as evidenced by parts of the Himalaya where the glaciers are dramatically receding, and it's the, the home of seven of the biggest rivers in the, on the entire continent of Asia, that we're talking about a water source for 1.5 billion people. So what happens when those are gone or largely gone? Or we could talk about it where I live up here in the Pacific Northwest, where glaciers are a huge a huge source of water for drinking and especially for agriculture. And we know for a fact that all of these glaciers are projected to be gone well before 2100. And when you come up here and look around, then that really gives you an idea of how severe these impacts are because there's hundreds of glaciers up here. They cover huge amounts of area and they're literally receding by visible amounts every single year. Um, we're talking about a, a major, major water crisis for humans. But then also for other species, glaciers control, they play a key role in, in controlling the temperature in the valleys where they're located. Their, their water 
their meltwater keeps streams a certain temperature so that certain species can live there, that if those glaciers go away and those water temperatures, uh, the water either completely goes away or the water temperatures go up because it's limited to just melting snowpack instead of ice, then those species of, of fish and insects will no longer be able to live there. And then everything else in that valley that relies on those species to eat, whether it's birds or bears or fox or insert name of animal here, then those are going to go away as well. Uh, and then there's, there's other dramatic ecological impacts, like uh, when glaciers go away, it's going to change the water system in the entire valley. So where certain trees grow, they're no longer going to be grow. That's going to change the entire vegetation of the, of the valley. And again, all the other species relying on it being a certain way is going to be affected. So we're talking about massive, massive changes, biophysical changes to the planet when glaciers go away, and not just the drinking water crisis that that poses for human beings. Including last week's report that made the front page of the New York Times revealing that the oceans are heating at a much faster rate than previously predicted. And then this week's uh, report on Greenland and how the ice is vanishing far faster than anybody predicted. It seems every scientific report did what scientific reports do, and that's reported conservatively. Do we have any sense of how soon it will be when weather events will become so extreme that there will be an aggressive response to climate change. Because New York City, they're still developing the shoreline, and ocean levels are going to rise and destroy that development in the very near future. Yeah, I was just out there for the the book launch a couple of weeks ago, or a week and a half ago, and standing amidst all that infrastructure and watching the insane rebuilding that, that happened in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. And talking to my friends that live out there, and they, too, just shake their heads. It's, it's surreal. Or being down in South Florida doing research for my book, interviewing some of the leading sea level rise experts on the planet who are talking about you know, upwards of 10, 20, possibly 30 feet sea level rise in the not-so-distant future. I mean, Dr. Harold Wanless cites a James Hansen peer-reviewed study that says look, we could be looking at 10 feet of sea level rise just by 2050. I mean, we're talking about 31 years from now. And yet you look at Miami and a quarter of the buildings have cranes on them, the amount of construction that's going on. It's just booming. It's, it's, it's amazing and also kind of crazy making to be in these places where there, there is not the response. I mean, let me just, I'm going to break it down and use a very, very small scale example that I think makes my point, which, you know, I live in a little town called Port Townsend, Washington. It's up on the northeast coast of the Olympic Peninsula. Really, really great place to live. Lots of forests nearby, several national parks. Um, pretty, very progressive political, politically progressive town. And yet the city council, the best they could come up with recently, full well knowing about climate change and what's coming, they just decided to invest several million dollars in uh, infrastructure underneath the, the downtown Main Street, which literally sits right on the water. Maybe it's five or six feet above sea level, uh, putting in new sewage and electrical, et cetera, et cetera, millions of dollars. Meanwhile, if you look out west, two different Native American tribes, the Macaw tribe and the Quileute tribe, are already heavily invested and are actively physically moving their villages higher uphill and away from the coast. So which one of those makes more sense? Yeah, which one of those makes sense? It's pretty obvious to me. So you write that countless glaciers, rivers, lakes, forests, and species are already vanishing at a pace never seen before, and all of this from increasing the global mean temperature by only, quote-unquote, only one degree Celsius, above pre-industrial baseline temperatures, according to some scientists, could rise as much as 10 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. So, Dar, do we need to return to pre-industrial living to stop the worst effects of climate change? Because that's one of the things that previously climate change denialists have been telling us for years. Well, I no, I I think that well, I think essentially the Earth is going to do that for us. I think, I think this Western so-called complex civilization and this fossil fuel-based economy is a dinosaur, and we are watching it 
in a state of collapse at this point. It doesn't work. It hasn't worked. The disparities are off the charts at this point. They're grotesque, if you ask me, the disparities between the haves and the have-lesses or the have-nots. And it's, it's, it's a failure. And we're, we, we are watching it, I think, in a state of, of collapse. Uh, and yet we, we look out across the planet and there's plenty of other groups of people, uh, indigenous people, uh, and not just indigenous people, but other people who are choosing like, consciously to live closer to the planet. And it's, it's healthier for human beings. The people who do it are happier. And it's obviously far, far better to the planet to live more simply and live closer to the planet. This does not mean crawling back into caves or or, you know, living in lean-tos in the trees or something like this. I mean, we can live uh, using energy very, very smartly. We can, we can use renewable energy. Uh, I did plenty of people living off-grid already that are plenty comfortable and have plenty of food, et cetera. And so it's, it's really, a, I think, a hearkening back to a lifestyle of let's live closer to the planet because, P.S., uh, we're from the planet and we're of the planet and we cannot exist without it. And if, if people's idea of living um, a civilized life and comfortably means living surrounded by concrete and steel and completely detached by, uh, from nature, uh, well, if you ask me, I, I think that, that sounds pretty sick. We were talking with Nicole Ashoff earlier about how unless the crises of the day affect the most powerful, there might, there's very high potential that there wouldn't be a reaction to it until it affects the powerful can we individually, can Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos or Warren Buffett or the Koch brothers, can they protect themselves from climate change while the rest of us suckers suffer? Because if they can, then we shouldn't expect anything to be done about climate change. I think that they can individually. Clearly, these people have enough money to literally even ponder building spaceships to escape, you know, I mean, which is complete insanity and won't work. But say that, they have enough resources themselves to at least buy them time, having plenty of food, living comfortably, staying detached, et cetera, et cetera. However, their businesses and where they get all that wealth that enables them that little cocoon of so-called protection, their businesses will suffer. And when, when for example, supply chains that are required for this whole economic system not just shipping goods around the world, but food and water. When those supply chains become increasingly difficult to maintain and then begin to fail because of disruption, because of uh, um, governments and, and nations turning into failed states, which we're already seeing this happen. I mean, just look at the news. Look at the refugee crisis besetting Europe, the Arab Spring, the impact of that, which is for, without a doubt climate change related. Uh, of what caused much of that to happen and, and continues to perpetuate the crisis there. So as as these waves start getting sent through the system and these supply chains start to crumble and be disrupted and become interrupted, and then business as usual starts to become increasingly untenable, that's when those people start to feel it. And again, it's just like with the Trump administration. The only language they're going to understand is money. And so when their money is threatened or they are making less of it or they're not going to make as much as they wanted, then perhaps they'll do something. All right. I want to get to your whole concept of hope, hopelessness and grief, because I found that fascinating. You write during my years of reporting from Iraq, I felt a mixture of sadness, guilt, anger, powerlessness, anxiety, despair and grief. I went to Iraq to report on how a violent, chaotic occupation was crushing the Iraqi pe people and shredding the fabric of their society and culture. I wanted to offer my body and heart in solidarity with them. And you mentioned listening to their stories and sharing their grief. Then you add my trip back up Denali uh, when you go mountain climbing in Alaska was yet another iteration of this. I began to realize the need to share my grief with others about what was happening to nature. To you, how much does that define what journalism is, or at least your journalism, sharing the grief of what's happening around the world with those who cannot be eyewitness to that grief? That was the whole goal of my book, and it was really doing my best to, with, with the book and now with my writing, 
uh, my current writing is to bring it to people because we've become so disconnected from nature. And I think that is the root cause of climate change, because if if most people were living closer to the planet and watching and paying attention, then I think the alarm bells would have been sounded uh, sooner and and simultaneously been much more widely received. And so my my hope and my aim, and I feel like I accomplished this in the book, was to bring people to these places the best I could through my, my writing, through introducing them to these scientists who have dedicated their lives to studying and hope, you know, hopefully adding to protection and conservation of some of these things that they study and love, and, and bringing my own personal, emotional, visceral response out in these places, watching the loss happen, um, to really bring that home to people in a way that I, I hope would start with really re-engaging them with, with becoming reconnected to the planet, that I think that is the first step that all of us have to, to take at this point. And then by doing so, it, it's going to entail grief. It's going to entail shock and sorrow and anger and sadness about already how much has been lost. I mean, we are in the sixth mass extinction. There's between 150 and 200 species a day going extinct. Uh, it, this is a thousand times higher than the normal background extinction rate. We're essentially replicating the conditions that set the stage for the Permian mass extinction of dramatic, abrupt warming of the planet, massive amounts of CO2 injected into the atmosphere. And now it, we're as things melt off, we're waiting for bigger and bigger methane releases and things start getting kicked into overdrive. As people start to realize these things, as I did when I really dove into climate reporting about 10 years ago, uh, I went into a deep depression and I struggled mightily for months and I would say then even years of how do I keep looking at all this in the face and then stay human and have a life and, and live in this world. And that, that is what I get into at the end of the book of how do we do this now? How do we be? And I think it comes down to how am I going to choose to comport myself during this time? It is, it is the era of loss. It is a time where we're in unprecedented territory as a species. We don't even, we're not, we can't even say anymore for sure that this species is going to have longevity. Uh, it, it could, we, we, but we don't know. I mean, that's seriously a big question mark at this point. And all of that internally that that brings up in us. And so it's in that context where I really take on this idea of hope uh, it, because hope you know, it's so misused, and I think it actually detracts from and downplays the gravity of the situation, that we have to first accept, look, I am mortal, uh, so much is being lost, and we might not make it, and, and really be clear about how far along we really are before we can start making the important personal choices that I think each one of us now needs to make about what is really important in my life. Is it making money or is it spending more time with nature and with people I care about and trying to do things that are better for the earth? What are my choices going to be? And if I need to start making some changes in my life, why am I waiting? You know, I mean, I think that is the urgency and the gravity of our situation. And, and I, I'm just doing my best to, to I, I hope, <laughs> there, I'm going to use the word hope, but on this matter, I, I do hope that this work helps people understand that and, and uh, kind of come to terms with where we are, because uh, it is also a very, very precious time in history, and there are still these things on the planet that deserve our attention and our care, and they are still here, and we still do have a chance to save parts of the planet and some of these species. How can grief empower us in a way that hope cannot? I think it breaks open, for me personally, it breaks open my heart, to really go through this milieu of emotion. And it's, it's from this deep well of sadness that really even deeper than that comes from, look, I really love the people that I'm close to. I really love this planet. I really love these parts that I'm attracted to and, and, and bend my life around so that I can consistently go up into the mountains and, and uh, worship. You know, and I would use that term literally to, you know, pay homage to the earth and, and, and give back however I can and listen. And, and I think that the more people that can be doing this, the better at this stage in history. And, and that's, 
that kind of motivation is only going to come from the love that comes after going through the real grieving process of what's already been lost and understanding what is now at stake. Literally, life on the planet is at stake. And, and I don't know what better motivation there could be than people really getting that and then being motivated not out of fear or, you know, fear or hope, which are based both based in the future, but out of a current present love for, look, I love this place. I feel more morally obliged to go try to do something about what's going on. And this has lit a fire underneath me. And I'm going to go, I'm going to go take these actions because I care about it. It'd be the same way as if a dear, dear friend of mine, and I share a story of this at the end of the book, if a dear friend of mine is in what I believe to be a hospice situation, I am going to give that, that person my full undivided attention. I'm going to be there to serve his every need. And I, I don't want to miss one second of it. I don't even want to blink. I'm, I'm going to show up and I'm going to be there for that. And I feel like that's where we are with the planet. You quote Stan Rushworth, an elder of Cherokee descent who has taught Native American literature and critical thinking classes focused on indigenous perspectives for more than a quarter of a century, telling you a story about his father, a veterinarian who worked closely with the University of California, Davis. Rushworth described his father as an excellent diagnostician and scientist who told him back in the 1980s, the dire position we're in now is solid evidence of the fact that the predominant civilization does not have a handle on all the interrelationships between humans and what we call the natural world. If it did, we wouldn't be facing this dire situation. It wouldn't be an issue. We simply do not have a big enough or right-minded enough vision. Because of this, we need to allow for something we cannot understand. This is not about hope, but more humility and carefully considered action within that humility and much deeper listening. You write, that story has helped redefine my entire relationship with the mountains and provided profound meaning as to why I have been drawn up into the mountains since childhood. How so? Why is what Rushworth's father told him so important to your understanding of your relationship with nature and you think it should be so important to all of our understanding of our relationship with nature? There's there's two two parts to that. One is that indigenous cultures, and I learned I was reminded of this by conversations I'd had with with Rushworth, is that unlike Western, the Western paradigm uh, is that we have rights, we have human rights. Well, in their way of living and their beliefs, they have obligations, obligations to future generations. And obligations to, to the planet. So that completely turns on its head our idea of life and what's mine and how can I get what I deserve and blah, blah, blah. And how can I serve the planet? And how can I serve the generations that are to come? Because if we're living from that place, we're going to be making very different decisions as a society than what we currently see playing out before us that is literally consuming the planet. And then the second Part of that answer is to share briefly the story that I also include in that part of the book where uh, uh, Rushmore shared with me a story told to him by his elder, Daryl Wilson, also a, 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 a member of the Pitt River Nation and also being a, another uh, Native American, who shared a story about uh, Mount Shasta, which his people refer to as Akuyet. And within Akuyet, there was a very, very small but extremely powerful spirit called Mis Misa. And Mis Misa sang uh, a song. And Mis Misa singing that song kept the earth in balance with the sun and the position the right way and kept the seasons timed the right way and it kept all life in balance the right way. But if that only occurred is if people prepared themselves and listened to the song by going up Akuyet and, and listening in the right way. And as long as people were listening to that song, Mies Misa kept singing and everything stayed in balance. But the story warns that if people stop listening, Mies Misa will eventually stop singing and everything will go completely out of balance and literally to the point of threatening life on Earth. And so when I heard that song, I really realized for me, that's why I've always been drawn up into the mountains, because it's where I go to listen. 
and the importance now of listening to what the planet is telling us, it's impossible to talk about how critical that is, even though it seems like it's so late in the game. And, and it is. But, it, but nevertheless, we have to listen. And I think the more people who decide, I need to go to my place to listen, whether it's in a park in the city, whether it's staring up at the sky, whether it's going to the ocean, whether it's going to the mountains, however we listen, we have to listen because we haven't listened for so long. You mentioned how you relish that unfilled time. Uh, how how do you define unfilled time? Is it simply time that is not dictated by capitalism, that is not dictated by the market? And does that then make your make any kind of communing with nature, if you will, by the public? Does that make being in touch with nature, getting in touch with nature, a revolutionary, if not anti-capitalist act? I think it is at this point. And by, by unfilled time, I mean literally unfilled time. You know, anything that uh, has a power button, don't even have it on your person. Turn it off and leave it someplace else. Uh, no distraction. Just go out and literally be right exactly in the place where you are and, and have your mind right there and pay very, very close attention. And I think it is a revolutionary act. You know, I'm really glad that you frame it that way because it is the antithesis of this, this corporate capitalist culture that programs us that we have to work. We need more money. You have to buy shit. You're not okay unless you buy this. You stink. Buy this deodorant. You're you're ugly. Go get this uh, workout by this you know taught by this fancy trainer. You know go buy these different clothes. Go buy this car so that you're going to get to be with the person that you want to be with. Go buy this house. Get a mortgage. I mean all these different things that were pro. You know you need this. You have to produce. You have to buy. You have to consume. You have to spend. You have to make more money. Instead, what if we just go out? And it's, we all know it's the simple things and it's the things that don't cost anything that are always the most meaningful. A really good conversation with someone that we care about, a, a, a really just beautiful, peaceful time, sitting out in a bunch of trees, watching them sway in the wind. Um, these are the things that really matter. I mean, because even the corporate culture that sells us, uh, you know, trips or cruises or vacations, you know, it's always an image of someone sitting out in the mountains or looking out at a beautiful landscape. And, and that really is, I think, what, we, what really speaks to all of our hearts. And so the reality is we can all just go do that for free. You know, you can just literally walk up and spend some time with a tree. And I'm not trying to be cliche, but I, re I think that is really where we are. That we, we need as much in any kind of connection as we can get and as many people doing it, because if we really, really listen deeply to the earth, uh, we're going to hear exactly what it is we need to hear. And, and she's going to tell us what it is that we need to do uh, for ourselves and for the planet. You write that for decades, many of us have turned a blind eye to what is happening to the planet. But now, given that Earth may well be dying, we may be ready to stand up to protect what we love. An extraordinary alchemy can take place when people follow their inner directives to stand up and face squarely the dire odds of biosphere survival. These actions involve extraordinary outer and inner courage, which can nurture a profound activism. The gifts provided by the crisis at hand are the conditions that make possible widespread shifts in political identity, purpose, and consciousness. Now, you're looking for outer and inner courage, but it seems that we instinctively view any change with fear. You seem to be saying that we should embrace change as it will lead to a better life. Why does fear of societal change outweigh the fear of climate change? Why can we imagine, as people keep repeating, the end of the world easier than we can imagine the end of capitalism as it exists today? That is a, a great, great question. And, and I, I, it would be fantastic if we could just be asking that as, of ourselves and as a country and as a culture on a daily basis. And I, I think it's because I, I'm going to just theorize here. But my guess would be that the, the requisite change 
from shifting to this current power structure, uh, from this current power structure into the right way of living with the planet would absolutely be revolutionary and radical. And it would mean uh, everything has to change, literally, that our, our way of life, how we uh, transport ourselves, how often and how far we transport ourselves, how we produce our food, how we get our food, how we earn money, how we uh, uh, take care of our families, literally everything. It, it is that moment in history, I feel, where absolutely everything has to change. And climate change is forcing this issue. So there is no question to me that this is going to happen. The question is, do we want to come willingly or are we going to be dragged kicking and screaming while things are collapsing around us? And, and it's going to be too late for a lot of us because the food and water crisis that is in the not so distant future is going to force all of these issues. And so uh, I think that's it. You know, and I think deep down inside, you know, we're all animals. And I think everybody really underscores, really gets the scope of, of where we are in this process. Just like that, that period of depression and mourning that I went through when I really first connected all the dots, it was for me about six, six years ago when I really, really got the depth of the crisis. And then, so I think people are afraid of that and they're afraid to come to terms with that. And we have a grief averse culture. You know, this is a culture where, you know, you're not supposed to show your feelings. If you cry in public, you have to apologize and excuse yourself. I mean, this culture is very, very, very sick in that way where it's not okay to literally be a human being and feel anything other than great and happy and proud or what have you. So I think it's, it's really all of those things why so many people are so afraid to confront this change that I, I know without a doubt is upon us. It's just if you live in certain parts of the bubble of this uh, capitalist experiment in the United States and, and, and haven't been had to live in wildfire smoke or haven't had your house burnt to the ground or you don't have flooding that's now making it impossible to keep living where you are, then you can still be in denial about, about these things. That's why Dar Jamal has been coming on our show for two, 20 years now. Dar, you are one of my very favorite guests we've ever had on the show, and I just want to thank you for all of your years of support. You are one of the best conversationalists I've we've ever had on the show, so I just want to thank you for all of the times that you've come on our show. So thank you very much, Dar. Well, thank you, Chuck, and I would say exactly the same thing to you as a host. Uh, Dar Jamal is a journalist and author of The End of Ice, Bearing Witness and Finding Meaning in the Path of Climate Disruption. You can find out more about Dar at his website, darjamal.net, and you can follow him on Twitter, at Dar Jamal. One last question for you, Dar, and as always, it's the question from hell. The question uh -oh. we, we hate to ask, you might hate to answer. Our audience is going to hate your response. I think I'm going to love your response, actually. We've learned on this show that capitalism couldn't have had the success it had without colonialism, and colonialism couldn't succeed without slavery, and the British Empire and the United States were superpowers that owe everything to capitalism's colonialism and slavery. So could have capitalism succeeded without climate change? Hmm. That is a great question from hell. Um, I'm going to keep it very simple and say that it, it, it couldn't have because it inevitably was going to cause it. Is that, how's that answer? <laughs> that answer is making me come, <laughs> spit up my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> so Dar, thank you very much for being back on the show. And man, if you ever have an opportunity to be here in Chicago, please make sure you, uh, you know, Hook up with me because, dude, I really want to hang out with you again. It's been far, far, far too long since Kathy Kelly and Danny Muller introduced you to me. So thank you so much for all of the support and every appearance you've done on our show. Well, you can count on that, Chuck. Thanks a lot, buddy. I really appreciate it. All right. Take care, Dark. You've been listening to a This Is Hell interview. For more interview hell and to support the show, visit thisishell.com. <laughs>